It looked up data for what were the most reproductively advantageous ways to conduct oneself throughout all of human history. Humans seem to practice something called serial monogamy. So we mm -hmm. date, we break up, we date, we break that, up. That's what I just yeah. And that is, not only is that what we tend to practice, um, that is the most successful reproductive strategy. Yeah. Um, promiscuity is a feature. I think promiscuity is really bad. I think men and women both want to avoid promiscuity. Men because they don't want to be cuckolded. It's a really this man, this is a man that is attracted to other men. Why in the world is he brought is he brought on to discuss relation dynamics between a man and a woman because can, can because, I defend, can I defend him on that? Yeah, I want to defend him too. This is getting ridiculous. You argue that divorce actually helps men more. Statistically, yes. Do you, do you think that pair bonding is real? Yeah, so the thing is, is it real? It's it's a spectrum. So there are 5,000 species of mammals on Earth right now, 3% of them pair bond. Mm -hmm. So pen bonding is not a normal, the, the difference for people to understand, the difference between, the evolutionary difference between mammals and say lizards, uh, reptiles, is the, the development of the neocortex. Mammals have live births. Lizards do not. They have they have they lay eggs and they don't care for their young the same way. So one of the adaptations for mammals is the fact that they care for their young. The necessity that's the investment by the male and the female and different mammals have different <clears throat> amounts of um, investment for the males. Uh, and so what, the thing is with Homo sapiens, do I believe in pair bonding? I believe that the way Homo sapiens. This is the way Doctor Bus describes it. It is a lifetime of poly of polygamy. Oh no, poly polyandry. I'm sorry. Uh, Polygyny, polyandry, poly, polygamy. Polygyny. No, polygyny is two, two, uh, two women and one man. Uh, polyamory, a lifetime of polyamory interspersed with small periods of monogamy. That's how I would answer the question. So there's not one total answer for it. Pair bonding uh, in the uh, Pleistocene times would be a man staying with his wife for at least three years until the child would be able to walk. Mm -hmm. Um, that part I do agree with. Do you uh, believe in like the oxytocin love chemical? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so here's a question that I have essentially around this pair bonding oxytocin thing. Why would women have two contra indi indicatory uh, like reproductive strategies here? Why would she have oxytocin that bonds her to a party, but also be drawn to the alpha beta box reproduction? She has a strategy? higher reproduction great, cost. Great, great question. So the thing, you know, she has a higher reproduction cost, but the, the, the reason why this is a, a relevant question is her cheating on her man does not afford her more Remember David Buss's article. Mm -hmm. It does not afford her more children. She does not have, she could have the most children possible by aligning with one alpha male, just to use that term, one alpha male, and then having as many children as with, with every two or three years. That mm -hmm. would be the, the, for her to have the highest level of offspring. Where we're probably going to separate is I believe in the mate switching strategy. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, she, I think she's cheating to find better sperm. He may say something to the effect of he's cheat, she's cheating to have sperm and then have the other beta be cucked. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but that's, that's the answer. That the, one it's of those two things strategy, would be the answer. put it that way. Yeah. One of those two things would be the answer. Well, the other Sorry. thing is that you have to define like what is reproductive success, success for female and the male okay so for reproductive success for that woman is quality i want to find the guy who's the best quality guy that i can get he's got to be you know like i said the 666 right you know six foot tall everything else he's got to be the best quality guys are scattershot again it's the r and the k reproductive system uh, reproductive models i guess okay men tend to be much more r selected women are k selected meaning that they're going to want to be more because they have to well, for they, the selection i think that refers investment. to the species i don't think it's, it, it, just does, a, it does it does but yeah. what, what i'm saying is uh, if, if you were going to like translate it from like what's what's men's reproductive strategy versus what's women uh, men you know we're, we're ejaculate and evacuate right it's it's get in get the job done and go because for one one ejaculation we have like a million sperm so it's scattershot right for women it's one it's it's the it's the what is it uh, sperm is a uh, sperm is cheap and it, it, uh, the way the way so it's a parental investment mm -hmm. hypothesis mm -hmm. the way you said it before is there's so much less investment necessary for a man than mm -hmm. for a woman and so for a man to pass on his genetics Qua a a quant quantity of women would be more important than quality and for women to be the opposite. Well, so, in, in a pragmatic sense, I'm not saying it's the most ethical. I'm not saying it's immoral. I'm not saying whatever. I'm just yeah, saying in the most pragmatic sense. sense. Okay. okay, I'm going to bring all of this crashing down, okay? okay? I hear that we talk about this as a theory a lot. I don't think anybody is pr a proponent of this theory anymore. Um, you brought up Bus, and I know that you said you have contentions with Bus's current work. It's because he no longer believes in this kind of like dual selection strategy. Um, and do you, then, Do you been, believe in a, a mate switching strategy? No. You don't um, believe in a mate switching strategy. When I when I looked up data for what were the most reproductively advantageous ways to conduct oneself throughout all of human history, humans seem to practice something called serial monogamy. So mm -hmm. we date, we break up, we date, we break that, up. That's what I just yeah. And that is not only is that what we tend to practice, um, that is the most successful reproductive strategy. Yeah. Um, but that's the, a mate switching strategy. It well, 
it, but it's not like you dump somebody uh, immediately just to like upgrade because that, I don't think there's any evidence for that. There's well, no data for that. The, the thing is, how, how do you make data for upgrade? Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, sure. So, well, so here are some things that people measure. So one thing is, um, EPP I think it's called extra pair partners. Um, when people do broad research in society and they try to find like how many people are having these extra pair partners, how many people are married to the beta bucks and then f***ing the alpha guys for the genetics, um, the highest rate you can find in the poorest of areas is 6%. But globally speaking, it's about 1 to 1.5% in almost all areas. So the idea that women are going out to fuck men and then coming back to their beta guys, there's no data to support that. Not right. only is there no data to support that, from an evolutionary point of view, it actually doesn't even make sense if you really think about it because human females don't actually give any outward indication when they're fertile. Um, so, for instance, we're talking like, like no, no, that. Got it. Yeah. Estes, the Estes stuff, right? Yeah. So, for instance, when we talk about like cats, if I wanted to be an alpha male cat and have a fuck ton of kids, that's a very easy thing to do because you can see when cats are in heat, yeah. when they're in their mm -hmm. Estes, right? You find the cat that's screeching and then you fuck them and you have a kid and then you peace and you can get a lot of cats pregnant that way, I imagine, if you're a tomcat and you're trying to fuck a lot of cats. Yeah. But for human females, the only way to ensure actual reproductive of success is because they don't give any cues externally about the status of their fertility is to just stay with one and have sex over a long but, period but of there time. There are stud still studies that show that women act differently when they are all they are there, are, there are studies that show that women have different preferences sometimes when and they, they are different parts. That, yes, mm -hmm. but it's whether or not they act on those. And this is the importance of measuring extra um, extra partner pairings is that you can ask a woman, do you think that certain men are more attractive at different parts of your mm -hmm. period? Mm -hmm. um, um, or at different parts of your ovarian cycle or your, your cycle, basically. Menstrual. And women will say yes, but they don't actually act on it. So you're, you're just saying that these are preferences, but they don't act on it. Because there's a study, again, at the end of uh, Why Beautiful People Have More Daughters by Satoshi Kanazawa and David, but or I'm sorry, David Allen, where mm -hmm. they talk about women actually retain more sperm from men that they cheat with than men that they don't cheat with. And that was part of the reason why the dual mating strategy came about was because of those studies. And there's also there's also some I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, Dr. Marty Hazelton. I, I've been using her work since the very earliest days, also a student of Dr. David Dr. Buss. Buss. OK, uh, and so uh, in her, she's got a book called Hormonal, and it's it's basically the ovulatory shift, because what we're talking about here is ovulatory shift. OK, so mm -hmm. when we talk about the dual mating strategy, ovulatory shift proposes that when a woman is in her uh, proliferative stage, when she's in the ovulatory stage, she's looking for a guy with more masculine features. She's looking for the guy who's going to like slit throats, right? When she's uh, has had the uh, when the the egg has already dropped and she's already passed the ovulatory phase, she gets into what's called the luteal phase. In the luteal phase, that's when she's looking for comfort. She gets into a, a what uh, what Dr. Marty Hazelton has said is a sort of a, a nesting. It, what, what, it, what it translates to is when a woman does get pregnant, she goes through, uh, I want to say it's the first trimester or like maybe the second trimester, she goes through what's called the, the nesting phase where she like wants to like, you know, put all the, you know, get the baby crib and everything else. But like, if you think of this in a shortened version throughout a 28 day cycle, that nesting period is right around where the, the luteal phase is. And that's when she starts calling up her, her telephone friends and she like guys with more female features. or so she wants her girlfriends to come and hang out with her and she's feeling bad because she's she fucked the guy on, you know, in the club when she was in her luteal phase or her proliferative phase. And then she goes through the, uh, and this, again, this is theory, okay? But then uh -huh. she goes through the, uh, the, uh, was uh, uh, postmenstrual syndrome where she gets really bitchy. The, theory behind that is that yep. she, the reason she gets bitchy is because she's pushing away all the all the all the uh, beta males or all the more feminized the, the comfort guys away so that she can go back into that cycle once again so that she can she hopefully can reproduce in the next the, in the next pass in the next cycle okay so how does that relate to the dualistic mating strategy the the uh, the proliferative phase is what well what I would colloquially term as the alpha phase, and then you've got the beta phase, which is right after the the egg drops, and whether she's pregnant or she's not. Now, does people are going to say, well, what about hormonal birth control? We can talk about that later on. But as far as the dual mating strategy strategy is concerned, that's the micro um, biological side of alpha fucks and beta bucks. So when we're when we're talking about these things now, now here's I, I, I know the criticisms of, of this, but I want to point out also that in Dr. Marty Hazelton's uh, work, 
the idea where they go and they ask, say, well, are you attracted to these guys? Is it the guy with the, you know, the chiseled jawline and everything? And then, you know, women are saying yes and no. But the thing is, is that women don't seek extra pairs if they're already in what is termed as a satisfying relationship. Yeah. So that's where you get these incels who like just throw caution to the wind and say, oh, I'm doomed. It's hypergamy and it's like a straight jack and she's just going to want to fuck Chad when she's in her, you know, proliferative phase. And, uh, and the juice ain't worth the squeeze. Now, no matter what she's going to no, cheat, no matter what you're going to sure. do, which is bullshit because there's too many, there's too many variables right there, whether she can or she can't. But the most important one is this, is that in those studies, when Dr. Marty Hazelton was going through this, the women who stated that they were in a satisfying relationship, they wanted to fuck more, but they wanted to fuck the guy that they were with yeah. at that time. Yeah, again, remember, so, yeah, and, I, and I agree with this, but mm-hmm. again, fuck the guy they were with. That's not alpha fucks, beta bucks. That's just being with their partner. What, but hold on. What if, yeah. what if the alpha, what if the guy who was per, the provider and the lover were the same guy? What if it was Brad? The best of the well, I mean, that's the issue that researchers have started to converge on is because initially there was this kind of like dual selection hypothesis but the problem is every single time they try to research that it just doesn't show up um so gangstad was one of the original proponents of this theory and in june of last year he did a huge literature review on why we haven't seen any studies replicating this uh, dual mating hypothesis i'm not going to read too many black quotes but i'll just for this one here in our recent collected data set of 181 women we examined moderating impacts of ovarian hormone levels that's the hormone cycling we're talking about on the association between male partners attractiveness and women's extra pair sexual interests Analyses found that when women's progesterone levels were low, characteristic of the follicular and periovulatory phase, partner attractiveness more strongly predicted extra pair interest in a negative direction, consistent with previous effects. Okay. However, some pre-registered effects examined were near zero. So while these effects exist and st- are statistically significant, the effect size is very small. You mean they're right? actually having sex? Um, actually cheating. It, well, in terms of like they express an interest, but it's a small interest. It's statistically okay. significant. For yeah. instance, like I can measure a huge population and know with a high degree of accuracy, it's statistically significant. These, these people on average have 101 IQ right. and these people have a 100 IQ. Could, could that, could that well, matter? And then real quick, let me just real quickly just finish this block, okay? Um, all in all, the null hypothesis that there exists no effect is a very poor explanation of the overall pattern of the results, even if we currently do not fully understand the reasons for variable effects. This moderation effect if robust, begs a question. This effect assumes that women differentially value sexually attractive features across conceptive versus non-conceptive phases. Yet, as we discussed above, large-scale replication studies have not found strong, compelling evidence for hormonal moderation of mate preferences, for example, for uh, for muscular bodies. Durant et al. suggested one possible resolution. Perhaps mate preference shifts are moderated. For instance, women who are strongly attached to partners may express relatively little interest in extra pair men when conceptive. It may make sense that these women also show little evidence of increased interest in, say, muscular men when conceptive. The same may apply for women with attractive partners or, more generally, women who show relatively little interest in extra pair men during conceptive phases for other reasons. By contrast, when women do express interest in extra pair men when conceptive, they may be particularly interested in muscular men. This may be one reason why preference shifts are weak overall and not consistently detected and it also remains untested to date so it's basically saying that like if i find a woman and she's in a happy relationship she might have a zero percent chance of ever stepping out of that man if, but, she's, if she's in a happy relationship yeah yeah, yeah but it. if i test her on different parts of her period um, on different parts of her cycle i should say sorry different parts of her cycle at some part she might say i like muscular men more at this part of my cycle and we, but that's not indicative to- of to- anything totally agree and, sure. and what, what you're saying is study one more time um, so this the was researchers at all, which and yeah. sure. So it was um, the name of this is called Women's Estrus and Extended Sexuality: Reflections okay. on Empirical Patterns and Fundamental Theoretical Issues. And the two researchers are Stephen Gangstad and Trent Din. Gangstad was one of the original opponents. Yeah, so of he, the, was, he was a uh, uh, colleague of, of Hazelton. Correct. I'll yeah. just put Gangstad. Uh, all it's, tw- it's, tw- it's 2022. Yeah, June can I can I fuck this all up really quickly? Go for it, yeah. Okay. So 73 teams, the same hypothesis with the same data. Some found negative results. Some found positive results. Some. Mm-hmm. Found nothing. No effect of expertise or expertise or confirmation bias. Idiosyncratic research variability is a threat to reliability of scientific findings. This is Steve Stewart Williams who okay. wrote a paper. A paper the, the eighth uh, understood the universe. Uh, so what we're, we're talking about is the crisis of replicability right okay, now, so, which is rampant in in uh, academia. Right okay. Now. So 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 let's let's say this. Uh-huh. Let's say what your hypothesis is, and I don't disagree with this, is that they find them more attractive during different parts of their cycle, but they don't act on it. Yeah. And so my 
hypothesis is that alpha fucks beta bucks is not well, indicative of anything. Well, yeah. a second. So, mm-hmm. so we saw we saw that thing that Chris put up before, where it, not only were men having fewer sexual partners under the age of thirty, but mm-hmm. women also were having fewer sexual partners. So that's one reason why they might not be acting on it. Number two, when you talked about one percent, you were talking about genetic cuckoldry, the six percent or as, as low as one percent. Mm-hmm. The thing is, when women go outside the relationship, often they don't have unprotected sex. So it's really difficult for that for you to then say from that standpoint that even though she may cognitively be having sex with a better looking guy she may i mean she may cognitively know to use contraceptives she may subconsciously be like i'm still having sex with a better looking guy because i want his genes even though cognitively she's not doing that consciously she's not doing that but the other the other, do you understand what i'm saying she's still having fu- sex with a male stripper without the intention of actually having a baby with him whereas sure we can cave, say that but then that cave, kind of betrays cave woman ancestor was mm-hmm. not doing that her cave woman ancestor didn't have a condom does that make sense i can understand what you're saying but um the reproductive strategy just doesn't make sense because there's because one the men oh, wouldn't, I, I, the men I, I, wouldn't I, practice that reproductive no, no, strategy because no, it makes sense i agree with you he's the one who believes in, in oh, okay, sure. he believe in make switching hypothesis okay which, sure. so the thing is where i go to the, the difference is mm-hmm. women are cheating Number one, there are some women cheating. Mm-hmm. And when they cheat, they are doing so because they're in an un- unhappy relationship. So let's bring this all back around mm-hmm. to Dunbar's number and social media. More women are in unhappy relationships because they are comparing themselves to other people, other relationships, mm. and they have access to more men, which is causing more unhappy relationships, which is causing more cheating. Yeah, That's but despite issue. all of that, men still cheat more. Oh, I don't disagree with men cheating more. Only slightly now. But, but, oh, it's but, only slightly now, but they still, but you would imagine that but if they women- close together. If like closing the gap right there now. are a couple polls well there was a recent yougov one i read that new yorker article mm-hmm. um that you read that referenced one in 2016 that showed that the gaps were closing quite a bit uh but there's more recent data that shows that it's there's still a, about the thing is there's, there's an article like damn near every year where like the, it, and, and it goes both ways it sure goes well but the down. problem with that new york paper is it was citing something from a mckinsey institute which the people that they survey is questionable but but regardless let's say that even let's say that i grant you that it's the same if we're arguing that Women are hypergamous. Women have access to all these men on social media. Women are on Tinder, Instagram, and all this. And um, I know you've tweeted out before, and I think you guys have said, I don't know if you agree with it, that women celebrate cheating more than men, or like women are going to get shit from it. D- divorce. Sure. Divorce. Yeah, yeah. That, and that women's friends are going to be like, you go queen, and men are like, don't cheat, right? Go, if all of these things were true. Wouldn't we expect women to be cheating way more than men? No, because because women, and they have an easier time doing it because they go where they want, right? For sure, but women don't cheat more than men because men are more interested in casual sex. Like if you get if. Men, men are obviously, I mean, you don't dis- disagree. I mean, men are more interested in casual sex than women. That's the reason. So let's go back to the thing I said before. The main point of the study was that 83% of the time when a woman cheated on her, uh, stepped mm-hmm. outside of a, a marriage, she fell in love with her affair partner. When yeah, you, I understand what you're saying. 30% mm-hmm. for men, which means for men, they could have sex and it didn't mean as much. Mm-hmm. Where women, when they would have sex with another partner, their intention was to switch partners. Sure. And, so, and I could buy that. But then there's the the schism here is I'm fighting against the dual uh, dual sexual. It's, so I think it's all strategic right. sexual. The mate switching. You disagree with Rollo on the on the on the dual exactly. Mate. Yeah, because you guys have a big disagreement yeah, there. I mean, it's not a big disagreement. Because the question is, is, what is the mating strategy? Because you're saying women are always yeah. to find yeah. long term partners, which I agree with. Yeah, but, but here's the thing. Mm-hmm. The reason why I don't completely disagree is because. I used to live in Los Angeles and I live in Las Vegas and there's tons of women who are straight up cucking their boyfriends and I meet hundreds of them. <laughs> and then what you're going to say is, well, yeah, I mean, that's selection bias. Well, what I'm going to say is at the beginning of the debate, I agree that we're not going to do stories. We're just going to do all the research. Right. Right? Yeah, super research. Sure. What I'm saying is, but there's enough for me to say it's statistically viable that women are still doing what he's saying. It's just not all women. So the, d- the discussion is, is it 50, 50 or is it 85, 15 or is it 90, 10? Well, based on like cuckold, I think one of the studies I even have is like the like cuckolded fathers or whatever. Whatever. And again, those extra partner uh, again, parents but, are but, literally it's like one percent of because, all. Because of contraceptives, I don't know if that's. It's not even contraceptives. It's it's no no. It, this is historically because the only way they do this is through genetic analysis of like right. broad spectrum of people yeah. to try to figure out like uh, yeah. Um, th- so it just doesn't seem to be the case that many women practice that reproductive strategy. Another study that you guys bring up too that's kind of in this wheelhouse is the um, is the. Uh, a long time ago, there was a genetic col- collapse where there was uh, one man for every seventeen women, right? Are you talking about during the the? It was like eight thousand BC, 8, I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Eight thousand. Yeah. So the for a while, um, uh, in, in I think in twenty. You're talking about a near extinction event, but after the uh, agricultural revolution, what are you sure. talking about? There, well, there was a twenty fifteen study that showed that. Um, Prior to this, there was a big genetic collapse because of a near extinction event, but this was a particularly interesting one because it was only a genetic collapse of the Y chromosome. So it looked like for a while, uh, only 
uh, only uh, like there was like one man's genetic diversity for every oh, 17 are you, women. Are you talking about this whole thing? Well, De- uh, Pat Bet David came out with a thing saying 40 percent of men throughout history yeah. replicated and 80 percent of women. Is that what you're talking about? No, you it was more specifically it's something that Rolo specifically mm-hmm. brought up in his show that there were 17 women for every one man. Here, I'll um, get it for you. Yeah, yeah. there's a 2021 video where he brought it up. Um, I can play it for you if you want. I'll so, use it all the time. Sure. Yeah, on. exactly. I know exactly. Where However. Um, so researchers from Stanford in 2018 went back and they looked at this data and then they looked at how people lived in those time periods. Yeah. And if you really think about it, it's impossible that one man could have 17 women for a variety of reasons. Um, the first is because um, you can't partition that many resources. These were hunter gatherer tribes um, that were like doing early clans clearly like planning one man could never provision enough resources for 17 different women you couldn't you weren't you didn't have like castles and stuff so what was the 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 explanation so the explanation was back then the way that humans organized themselves was through patrilineal clans the way that it worked was if you had a clan and you went there it was one man and all the genetic lineage for the men were from that one man however women like genghis khan and kulia khan and a little bit but women would actually go and marry other clans. So what happened was, was anytime there was a, they wanted to or not. Sure. But what happened was anytime there were warring clans, what you would find is if one gets wiped out, that Y genetic lineage is gone because all the men are dead from that particular war, but the women were married off to other clans. So their chromosomes could continue to spread. So that Y collapse is most likely, and you can't prove it, but most likely the explanation, the reason why that Y collapse happened was because of the patrilineage organization of society in those days. And, and, and including the violence that was partaken from one tribe to another meaning what, mm-hmm. what you're saying is like one tribe kills all the males in another tribe and then takes the women and that's the or reason. just kills the whole tribe even okay. they can take the women out they don't have to but those women have already been married off to other tribes so their genetics are spreading more than the men For who sure. are self-contained sure. but it, I mean, even if you go back to the bible what is the the uh, jezebites the canaanites the all those the one it says it, mm-hmm. god says you're to kill the men and then to take the virgins do you remember that right. oh, so so in in that case we're still going back to the dark triad traits. We're murdering these men and stealing the virgins. Naked murder. Yeah, that, that, well, not, I mean, it's war, It's warring tribes. I mean, that was part of war. You don't yeah. have to be dark triad to get like, I don't think everybody that landed, uh, you know, at, at Omaha Beach, it was like a dark triad murderer, right? right. It's just part of war. Right? I'll read it to you. 8,000 mm-hmm. years ago, uh, 17 women reproduced for every one man. By the way, now, but through genomic tracking it's more like seven for one right now but this is eight thousand years ago analysis of modern dna uncovers a rough uh, dating scene after the advent of ag- agriculture once upon a time four thousand to eight thousand years uh after humanity invented agriculture something strange happened to, hu- to human reproduction that's very important after agriculture uh across the globe f- uh, for every 17 women that are reproducing uh passing on genes that are still around today only one man did the same now when I'm when we talk about this, that, the, whether or not the the you know how that happened, we can say well it's you know warring tribes and they're taking yeah. war brides. Uh, they you know it's forced sexual copulation since I can't well, say no that. no no. What I'm there's, saying there's is that like it's still it was why it could be, but, but it wasn't it, it was, wasn't one man for seventeen women. It was one man probably for like every um it was probably like. At the worst, it would have been like two women for one. But man. he passed on his Y chromosome to his son. And then that's it, what you're including in this. The issue is all the men stayed in the same tribe. If my tribe got into war with somebody oh, else, okay, my it. Y chromosome is gone. I'm wiped the yeah. fuck out. But the women go off and they marry. If I have daughters, she's yeah. going to go marry somebody else. So her genetic material okay. passes on. It was, so okay. if you it win was, this war for a thousand, for 4,000 years, well, what's going to happen is you're going to be deleting a Y chromosome every single time tribes go to war and somebody loses. But the female side is always going to live on because they outmarry these patrilineal it, it, it accounts for that. It wasn't like there was a mass death of males. There were, uh, they were there. So what were they doing? Right. Okay. So, uh, and this is the Melissa Wilson Sayers is the, the yep, she was the is. original one in 2015 right. so mm-hmm. uh, com- uh computational biologist at uh, arizona state university uh let's see another member of the research team hypothesizes that somehow only a few men accumulated lots of wealth and power so it could also so, be resource acquisition well, it was, but so in stanford their response to this the reason why that doesn't make sense is in every part of the old world every single part the bottleneck lifts approximately 5000 4000 years ago this is precisely the period when chiefdoms and states first emerge which are often associated with extreme inequality because once you've got a state now you can really have because think about it like 10000 years ago one caveman 
caveman can't have 50,000 resources. He's going to get right. fucking killed by another caveman, right? But this is when extreme inequality happens. Mass human sacrifice is commonly seen in first states, etc. However, the emergence of chiefdoms and states is associated with the lifting well, of the well, bottleneck, well, not the intensification, what if, meaning that the inequality yeah. wasn't what was causing it. It was the fact that these civilizations were no longer completely killing well, each other. Here's anymore. just a hypothesis. I haven't read this whole data, but mm -hmm. what if the, the advent of the chieftains actually caused it so you had more stable societies than what you had before? So the, the beginning of the agricultural revolution, which is 11,700 years ago, is the first point in human history where mm -hmm. one man had more than another man and one man worked for another man. So right. then we had more defined hierarchies. Those men up at the top had more sexual access, had se access to more women. And maybe it was just super inegalitarian and these societies were more fragile. And then once you had the chieftains and city states, now it's more it's harder for Athens to destroy Sparta. It, it becomes more difficult. And in, in those cases, that's the reason why more men would be able to procreate mm -hmm. and, and and whereas before you would have more men being disposable you would have less um i'm just saying think about it recently like it's not a good reproductive strategy if you have a whole collection of people and I, I nobody's you, allowed to have children but, but if you <laughs> but if you if you're killing if one tribe's killing another one it's not mm -hmm. a strategy it's just like survival socially enforced monogamy Sure. Um, well, to some extent, unironically, well, that is like not, the well, dominant. From, we went from, poly, I mean, Old Testament poly, polygynous, poly, polygamous societies, where it's one man with, with many like two so, wives and many concubines, whatever it is, and now you're going to one man, one woman, and, and we're changing really the mythology around that. Like, well, I'm, I, the biblical stuff is hard. Well, I mean, I don't it know. doesn't have to be biblical. It could be like, I don't know, the, the poem of Gilgamesh or whatever. I mean, there's it's at that time, that's when it became one man and one woman, whether sure, it's even whether prior, to that, culturally, prior to that, prior to that, it was never that unbalanced. Yes, but it, it coincided with agriculture. Sure. I'm, yeah, but I'm saying that even at the height of unbalance, it was never more than like yeah, one the, to three. The, the, the thing like, is, the thing is, it still was one to three. There are fewer men having children than women. Is that? Yeah, it was fewer, but not one to seventeen. One to three I, is I, a I, lot I, different than I one to seventeen. Think, right? did, don't, did you? Well, even now, it's one to seven, and they can show one to seven. So it's not. It's, it's somewhere between one I think to isn't seven it 40 and forty percent and eighty percent. I think isn't that the number? So, so that's. But, but who's to say? Like I, I don't know what the the numbers behind that, but I, that was Patrick Ben David putting out a thing saying forty percent of. Oh, well, throughout history, it was over the top. And eighty percent. Yeah, yeah. We did digress a bit here because yeah. we were talking about promiscuity, but I was really fascinated by what you guys were talking about. No, I mean, but, wait, when, okay. So as far as promiscuity, yeah, we agree. The thing. Is I think what the thing is, how much do we agree? I never thought it was 17 to 1. I thought it was okay, that's like, fine. Me, I thought it was maybe like three. I to heard one. the number 17 to 1, and this yeah. study gets thrown around, yeah. But the, it just it doesn't make sense because if you imagine that men were using their resources to capture women, why is it that when states emerge and wealth inequality starts to explode, yeah, we saw the bottleneck disappear because now inequality is getting bigger? Shouldn't it be even more women so, swimming? So but it's I, not, it I goes think, the I think possibly because you have a more, even though these people are these chiefdoms are you know totalitarian, I think you have a more stable society once you have cities. States. Yeah, and I think and getting so, wiped out because they're in patrilineage clans that are getting completely and totally destroyed. Right. I think right? I think the mm -hmm. likelihood of you wiping out one tribe or another once you have city states is less. It's it's not living in tribes it, anymore. They're not far. Exactly. Now it's yeah. harder to wipe out an entire. Yeah, I agree. Society. I think you guys are in agreement here. Yeah. Um, but we what are about going back to the to the promiscuity because I know. For, so well, just real quick, we can do the promiscuity right next. But I'm just the thing that I want to highlight in all of this because that one to seventeen yeah, thing does not be true. Main, the yeah. extra partner pairings doesn't be true. I don't see as a reproductive strategy this dual mating thing practiced anywhere okay. it doesn't show up in any empirical study ever it can't be measured it's a nice it's an interesting theory so, about like the parts so of the women's cycle okay yeah, yeah but, it's, right. but it doesn't seem to show up anywhere well, in the data let me, let me just explain one thing here's like when i see dr david bus who has his story i mean you can always go you can go back to trivers if you want you could you go back to the to the mid 70s where everybody where the dual mating strategy has become sort of picking up steam let's just say and then it comes into its own with gangstad and, and hazelton mostly um and everybody's all on board with that. And then suddenly somewhere around 2015, everybody wants to change their mind about it. And with that also coincides with the, the crisis of replicability. So that's number one. Number two is this is even if, even if dual mating, uh, the dual mating hypothesis is correct and the mate switching hypothesis is correct. You can still, they can still coexist together. Because if you're looking at dual mating, it doesn't necessarily preclude the interests or the reasons why that woman would want to be without that guy in the first place. So can we go and talk about sexy sons theory on top of that? So what, well, what I got, they, the whole point of dual mating is that mm, there is a difference between the beta provider well, and the alpha because, And I know we're saying that like well, the mate switching hypothesis presumes you're already in a relationship to begin with to cheat on that person in the first place. And but it, it still also, supports the dual. And the, it also presumes 
mm-hmm. that you are in a monogamous relationship, not in a polycule, not in some sort of sure, uh, which you is, know, but that thing. is like the reproductive success of especially men is the serial monogamy. It's being in a relationship for as long as you can. I think and for then being the in another lower, relationship, more quartile of men, you're correct. I don't think for all men. I no, think- no, no, no. For for reproductive strategy, period. Now, if you want to talk about exceptional circumstances where one guy is like buying rights to like the aristocracy or a harem, sure, we can talk yeah. about that. But that at that point, we're not talking reproductive strategy. We're talking about like some social that's like socially constructed, right? 20 women don't gravitate towards one man. It's one man has a kingdom and he says, you 20 women are going to live here. I'm going to kill you. Yeah. Right. So that I wouldn't consider that part of like reproductive strategy any more than I would say reproductive strategy is to play Starcraft for 10 years. So you can find a lot of girls that show up in your Instagram dance. Right. I wouldn't say that's like a valid reproductive strategy. That's like a very unique situation that work for you. Yeah. Okay. Sure. <laughs> but in terms of like trying to find research on this, like uh, Dixon at all 2018, Jones at all 2018, uh, Younger at all 2018, uh, Markin, uh, Markin Kowska at all 2018, Stern at all did three different studies, 2019, 2020, 2021. All of these people are trying to find evidence that women f- differently based on their hormone cycle. Nobody has ever and they been all started it when 2018. Well, th- but this has been researched for like 20 years. People are trying to get anything. Now, if you want to say that academia is broken, that's fine. But one of the reasons why I laid down those initial ground rules is because we ha- we can only argue from the data. I agree with you on that. Yeah, yeah because if we start saying like, okay. well, okay, so, so. data now. But because the thing that bothers me too is you guys are very keen to cite bus and gangstad yeah. when it supported you, but now that it seems like the research is doing in another direction, now we're like, okay, well, hold on. Well, now, I don't know about so, data. And I I would okay, it's it's too lengthy to put this in here, but there was an interview between uh, Dr. Gadsad and uh, Marty Hazelton. Marty Hazelton has also been the subject of a p hacking scandal kind of thing, where it's like she had an opposing group of of uh, female of mostly female psychologists who went out of their way to try to disprove her her uh for 25 some odd years of uh obligatory shift research so we already know that that element already exists there so we can talk about you know studies and everything else but you also got to look at the personal biases that are going on at that time right well, around that is say- true what about like mm-hmm. all of psychology initially if you look at I just, and I just treatment I just, of women I like all of that is just out of okay. pretty well, anti-women I, right I, 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 snort I, cocaine and in, interview yeah i'm talking about women are frigid well, because of bitches and women of all these problems and we all, all, all the cluster f- b personality disorders are built around like women traits and shit like want to f- their moms right. i'm not to say that like you're absolutely well, right what, that there is, are- so, uh, what i'm going to say is that, that I, I honestly i think that the the there is a a personal bias against obviously ship because it is an unflattering truth of female nature that's why they're going after it that's why it, that's why it's not reproducing or re- replicating but it's also one of like hundreds of other hypotheses that are either replicating not replicating or there's there are null results the problem is in academia right there and it all starts right around when you're saying that about 2018 which also coincides with about the same time that Dr. David Buss comes up with the mate switching hypothesis and comes out with men behaving badly and comes out with his own dating program at that time, endorsed by uh, Huberman and Alex Hormo. I mean, I don't know if Hormo is he, but I know uh, Huberman uh, is uh, on board with that. Chris too. Williamson and him are writing a book together. Yeah. Exactly. So, which, by the way, you can still sign up for the pre orders that's been out since like 2020. <laughs> so, so when I see stuff like that, I kind of go, you know, is there some reason why he's switching over to this right now? Because he's it's, it, he wants to turn a Buck. I don't know. But the, the fact of the matter is, even if that's the case, or even if that's not the case, I still don't see why obligatory shift or, or dual mating strategy can't also coexist with mate switching, because you would have to have a mate in the first place before you can switch the mate. How, what is the, what is the adaptive strategy to get to you for, to get that guy in the first place? Well, the adaptive strategy is just simply looking for the man that can provision resources for you the most. You but you're only to. focusing on one side of, of that, of that nature. Do you, is, uh, would you agree to this, that women want to get the best genetic material that they can get from a guy, short-term sexual alpha fucks and beta bucks being long-term security provisioning protection and parental. No, I disagree. So, and this is where I, I, what do you disagree with? The thing I'm going to say that I might lose the audience here. I I don't mean to, but I think that we, just real quick, because I don't mm -hmm. think you, just so you understand what you're saying, because you're saying that women want both, right? The guy that could provide and still total factor. I'm I'm saying that genetically, yeah, Mm -hmm. genetically what you want is you want resources. Like, 
we, See we, that, and that's what most of these guys are focusing on right can, now without yeah. looking at the guy who the hot guy in the foam can right, but, and we can draw like just so stories that sound good but one it doesn't show up in the data two anthropologically it probably wouldn't even make sense like even if you go to like the most barren tribes people are running down animals these guys don't look like arnold schwarzenegger a lot of these guys look like sure. long <laughs> he's saying the looks don't matter as much no I, yeah i'm saying that like looks can help a little bit but okay. like ultra jack but dudes those resources. muscles come from the gym right that's not you're not gonna find tribes in africa so, with guys that can bench 315 you know like it's not happening if your yeah. argument is that we're just saying alpha alpha fox is only the very good looking guy in the foam cannon party mm -hmm. that's just that's a placeholder what i'm saying what i'm saying is that the loser beta guy who's the lawyer who makes a of money in a genetic sense that is the alpha and that is who women would want to pass their dna with. Just, they wouldn't want to pass dna with the pool boy because he's a loser no offense he's a loser but, he doesn't have resources there's no guarantee he's going to yeah. survive long enough to reproduce there's no guarantee that he's going to be able to lock down a partner and reproduce but the beta guy that has tons of resources can lock down one or maybe even two depending yeah. on what you're at, like type of women that is the alpha but you don't think women are having sex with these good looking men um <laughs> or it doesn't, no, 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 and it, again like that's to go back would they no like it doesn't to. seem like it it doesn't seem would like they it. want to would they want to maybe but do they actually do whether, it or whether or not they can or they can't is also about that desire what did well, i say what, you guys which, which calendar sells more the, the dad bods or it's the not about the calendar though, because you guys, say, you guys say that the sex is that what exactly you're but the problem is that you guys are doing these you're, you're doing two things that are making it really hard to understand you're saying that women go on instagram mm -hmm. women go on tinder mm -hmm. women can any guy they want now, okay? Whether it's 50% of being flown to Dubai. But they would kidding. like to no, think sure. that they They'd like to make it, or they get passed around by these high value men. Also, women are hypergamous, okay? Mm -hmm. We know that they want to trade up as much as possible. We know that they want to leave their beta guy. But then when we go to the research, extra partner pairing children are almost unheard of. It's 1%. Yeah. When we look at like how many women are actually engaged in this behavior, it's non-existent. So, so and when we look at like cheating rates, it's men that are cheating more. So it seems like none of the data are aligning with, we have very clean and neat and cool theories, yeah. but they don't seem to explain yeah, anything. There's, 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 there's one invention that throws all that out the window. It's the common. Hormonal birth control. Yeah. Mm. yeah, but even historically, when we look at extra partner pairings, it doesn't seem to be the case. Well, I think that things change historically with, with Instagram. Things change historically with Facebook because okay. again, we go back to Dunbar's number. Mm -hmm. For those of you who don't understand, he's an anthropologist who believe, who came up with a theory that tribes were about 150 people. U.S. military units are also about 150 people. Once you get outside that number of 150, then you can't keep all those records in your head. Your RAM can't hold uh, enough faces and names. What, social media made it so that people who are built evolutionarily to only know 150 people now can know numerous amounts of people. Today, and like we see... And with that, we see a rise in men not having sex, a rise in the divorce rate. All those things are starting to happen because now what happened is during the, during the Dust Bowl, you had a wife, that wife you stayed with, you had a bunch of kids with her and you stayed with her for survival. Now in 2023, you have the access to see all these thoughts that are out there showing it off. They for everybody. They ain't going to be loyal to anybody. You're you know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's what my, that's my point. Is it, so you see this over and over again. I'm not trying to sit in here trying to denigrate women, but what I'm saying is now because you see more of these women, it's caused it's caused unhappiness in these relationships, which is causing more people to cheat. Now you're going to say, well, the, these studies back then didn't say this, or if you want to look at the genetic code from back, uh, you know, thousands of years ago, that may be the case. Our point, a lot of the points that we make in this is that things have changed recently. Since the advent of sure, social media. and that if you want to claim that, that's fine. But now you're doing something completely novel, and you can't really rely on the historical record because, again, there's. A, I know you want to keep marrying your points together, but well, we're not. The, the, the data where we show the 33 percent of men not having sex or 20 from 19 to 30. From yeah. those ages, 19 yeah. to 30. Yeah. That's not historic. I mean, it's historical, but it's not like sure. Going I understand, down. but like re resting on evolutionary psychology again, like you just said earlier, women don't want to have casual sex, right? As much as men. Then men why are do they? More but then, in but then why do they? the pool boy who can't provision resources who's not at the top of a social hierarchy who doesn't engage personal behavior the problem is they are though like some but women they're not are. i don't think they do that but some women sure yeah, but by and large, you're, presuming, you're, presuming you're presuming that a social construct which would be the top of the social hierarchy is what they're selecting for as opposed to what their genetic what they would say i want to fuck that guy because he's muscular he looks like he's physical prowess he looks like he could go and slit slit throats if he had to go sure, but that. then the, again in congruency with you guys women aren't leaving their lawyer husbands to date the pool boy no <laughs> I'm I'm on saying, the side. Nobody, nobody said that. Yeah, yeah. nobody said. But sure, but, they, but then that means then that you're you can't you have to disagree here. You guys, you can't have it both ways because you're you're talking no. about mate switching. Right. Where they're because so, earlier you gave me a whole thing about how women choose guys no, and they have sexually. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. Partially, okay. so, I'm saying is, is it totally eighty-five says. fifteen or is it fifty-fifty? There are. There's just too many women that I know that have two partners at the same time. Sure, but how many of them dumped the beta bucks guy to be with the pool boy? Right. So the did one, that ever the happen? One, the ones that didn't dump them uh -huh. agree with him. The ones that did dump them agree with me. They're saying but both, both their strategies can coexist. Both, both their strategies yeah. can coexist. There's just too many. Man, I'm just like 
you guys have had 2000 women on the show. We haven't had as many, but I like when you talk to them, they absolutely have a dude and a side dude. One of the things in the Aon research, the Aon, uh, uh, the study that Dr. Davis Buss talked about is that men and women admit to having three backup partners in their mind. Yeah. At well, least plan three. B. They have plan B. They have three backup partners. Now you're saying this is not manifesting into vaginal intercourse. And I understand what you're saying. The thing is, we don't know specifically what those numbers are because people don't always have sex with the intent to have babies. So that thing is cause, causing it, uh, calling it a dual mating strategy is also kind of a misnomer because people are having less children. They aren't. Sure, having but sex again, if you think mate. not having sex to have babies, then where is the evolutionary part of it? No, no, hold on. You can, you know, this is a great question. This is at the end of um, Satoshi Kanazawa's book, uh, Why Beautiful People Have More Daughters. One of the questions he proposed was, why do some people not want to have children? How does that fit evolutionarily? And the answer is this. In order to have kids, you don't need to want to have kids. You just need to want to have sex. sex. Boom. That's, the, that's the reason why it works. Mm -hmm. And so the, the thing we're saying before is like, what you're saying is it's not manifesting in cuckoldry, meaning having someone, some, raising someone else's kids. And what we're saying is it's still manifesting in protected sex or sex not during estrus that is not causing a new child to be born. Women are still cognitive of this idea. They watch Jerry Springer. You mm -hmm. are not the father. They don't want to be in that shit they understand that but they're still attracted to the neighbor or the they guy can be attracted but it doesn't show up anywhere in the data for actually making a different mate selection it's just very 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 slight but differences you're, in you're, preferences. But, I understand what you're saying, but you're stuck on the mate selection thing and people use condoms people i am stuck well i'm yeah, stuck on the mate selection because i feel like we're making yeah. descriptions of how women act in the world so what is based your, on these so things. It, it, mm -hmm. obviously i've paid a bucks mate switching what is yours my um, I, I think that people generally think? practice serial monogamy. I think that if you want to be a good partner, then you focus on like the traits that are desirable in a good partner. I think so, people tend to uh, want some serial monogamy, like you're saying, mm -hmm. but 13% of women and 20% of men cheat. That's sure. what I, that was. Hard. And 42% of children born in the United States are in born to unwed mothers. Yeah, so, sure. so, so the thing is, both things are true. The thing is, well, the, hold on, but no. Hold on, my my because mine is necessarily exclusionary. Okay, right? I don't think people are. I don't think women are selecting based on where they're at in their cycle for who their partners are and changing that every single month. I, I think necessarily. I, I think they, that, yeah. they could be, but they're having protected sex, and it's not. It's not ending in them having a baby. Okay, we can say they're having protected sex, but historically, there's no evidence for this. Which w before protection, there's no evidence of all of these children that are born to cuckolded households. It just doesn't exist. Right. That evidence is not existing. But, but we still do have. Um, what 40 percent of let's just say 40 percent of men and 80 percent of women having children uh -huh. so there is a selection bias where a large number of women are s selecting a smaller group of men i agree and there mm -hmm. are there's through hypergamy there's obviously a scale to say this man is higher status than this man who is lower status and women are choosing to let that man put his penis inside of her i, I don't disagree with any okay. of what you're okay. probably able to say but there's no dual selection going on she's just selecting there is no dual selection. It's just she's selecting. Right, but she but she has to compare one man to another at some point. She, she does has to. But there's no dual selection. That's one selection. What you're talking about is well, one okay, selection. But, so it's dual. Uh, it's mate switch. So remember my, my mate switching. Mate it's switching. Not, remember dual selection refers to every single month she's going to feel about a different way about a different type of man she wants mm. to fuck every single month. That's dual selection. It's tied to the you cycle. Know, you do know that there are other studies that aren't self reports where it's like, oh, I find that guy sexy. I don't find that guy sexy. There's also uh, was it sexual ornamentation. So when that woman is wearing that red cocktail dress and those hoop earrings, uh, when she's uh, going through her ovulatory cycle, that you can see. That is a quantitative study. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you might be able to find that. Um, and that does replicate <laughs> both in and out. It might, but there's a reason why the entire field is walking away from this, do from, they call it strategic selection, um, is because it, d you can't find evidence of this mating strategy. And it doesn't even make sense evolutionarily from like it's a male we, point of view. Because, and I can show you the studies for this as well, is that uh, we tend to find whatever is flattering to women in, in our psychological studies, we tend to find that more authentic and more has more veracity. It, it, well, I'm not talking about, I'm just looking at g like genome analysis for like extra partner pairings or like t in terms of like percentage of people cheating or I'm not looking for like, what do people find flattering? I'm just curious, like, what are the actual numbers? And it seems really hard to, and even like, um, so for instance, I've heard you bring up like the egg selecting thing before. Mm -hmm. um, w women's eggs aren't designed to like pick the alpha sperm. No, and no, 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 no. Are you talking no, about uh, parental, the, the parental investment hypothesis? Is that right? No, 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 no. no, 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 no he's, talking about, he's talking about how human, okay, so this is, this is actually pretty recent too. It's, uh, they discovered, uh, they, you ever read the book Sperm Wars? Uh, yeah. Throw it away because, yeah, away from, away. Well, no because, uh, and also sex at dawn, you can throw that you shit can away. Throw too. that away as well. Um, but well, because what I, what I was talking about on whatever podcast was that, that their, uh, human female ovum will not necessarily select, but it will slow down or speed up depending on whatever the particular proteins are about that particular sperm cell that is coming there. 
uh, to uh, to encourage one uh, sperm over the other to uh, impregnate or to fertilize that particular egg. Now, my my reasoning in all of this, and again, this is me spitballing here. I don't have like clearly. There's no like, oh, I'm going to pull that guy's that clearly. That's the alpha sperm. So let me bring that. Out. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that there had to have been at some point a need or an adaptation or a reason for that egg to be able to do that in the first place. So I'm not saying that it's selecting like the alpha sperm over the beta sperm. What I'm saying is that that had to happen so often that there were more men, there were multiple men's sperm at the side of conception that it would have been necessary. Sure. If you're saying that now, that's good. So two days ago, the quote I pulled was a woman's female ovum will select between competing male sperm at the site of conception, meaning that adaptation um, had to become useful because there are multiple men's sperm at the site of conception, Mm -hmm. uh, which sounds like it's picking between alpha and beta. Um, However, I didn't say anything about alpha and beta. You're talking about sperm wars. No, no, no. no, 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 Sperm wars is different because sperm wars postulated the idea that like certain sperm were like runners and fighters and stuff like that. And that that women evolutionarily were having multiple male yes. sexual partners at the same time well, the, the, whole, the, the point, the point is this is that promiscuity is actually a feature not a bug of human of, of hum, uh, humanity well, I, don't, I don't think promiscuity is a feature i think promiscuity is really bad i think men and women both want to avoid promiscuity men because they don't want to be cuckolded is a really bad thing this is why we tend they, to we would be one of the very few species that actually do that because if you're going to read it there's a great book it's called uh was it uh dr tim burkhead it's called promiscuity and it goes and maybe, well, here, just real quick on the, on the female like thing so Different sperm are different from the same guy. Mm-hmm. Not every sperm is a total genetic copy of every other sperm. Um, the things, the chemo that um, that the eggs are actually laying to attract other sperm, they're just looking for something called major histocompatibility complex. Okay, it's just yeah. like, yeah, it's it's immuno, um, it's it's immune system related things mm-hmm. essentially. It's for fighting infections. Yeah, it has nothing to do with selecting for the alpha male sperm or the beta. It can come from the weakest beta e fucking Parkinson's disease ever guy. Mm-hmm. But if he has a different um, MHC versus a super alpha guy that might be her fucking brother, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. The egg is going to slow down those sperm and hopefully speed up the sperm from the guy that has a better immuno profile mm-hmm. that is more um, synergistic. Well, with is what I, I and if you watch that, uh, the point i was making is that there had to have been a reason for that ad- sure adaptation but it doesn't have to be because multiple men were nutting in a pussy all at the same time it can literally be choosing between there sperm would have from to one be to- multiple sperm in that particular at that yeah, but but point. every male sperm is not the same it can choose between different sperm coming from it literally man. says that in the in the literature it the, can pick between differing men's sperm Dif- different sperm it's not different. It doesn't have to be different men's sperm. I'm it's just, just sperm. what I'm reading here. But the point okay. of the matter, the, the fact is, is that it picks between which which one is more compatible so, with it or whatever the proteins are that it's it's. Yeah, I, I, I don't I'm not an endocrinologist or whatever. Quick, real so, quick, real quick. We got uh, about twenty five thousand of you guys watching right now. Anything that Destiny says, matter, Myron. This man, this is a man that is attracted to other men. Why in the world is he brought? Is he brought? <laughs> On to discuss relationship dynamics between hey, a man and woman because can I, just, I know, can I defend him on that? Yeah, I want to defend Go him on. too. This is getting ridiculous. I totally understand why you guys don't have have a problem with the fact that he may be bisexual, but we have to separate the message from the messenger, or else we become a bunch of fucking bigots. The, the problem is like yes. I, right, I don't know, have you the, got it. I don't have the same proclivities that he does. Mm-hmm. But the truth is the truth. It doesn't make any difference that Isaac Newton discovered uh, the, the law of gravitation. He died a fucking virgin. That doesn't make him any less credible. Does that, you understand what I'm saying? Just just because he believed in God doesn't make him any less credible. So we just got to stop, like separate the message from the messenger. You may still even hate him, but separate the message from the messenger. He's bringing up data from surveys. I have a, uh, I enjoy that more than him calling me a cokehead. So I, I, I'm very appreciative of this. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, no, very, I agree. The, the, the truth is the truth, regardless of who says cokehead. Um, um, vasectomy. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the whole show. Well, before I, I make this a whole sperm war thing. So let's get to promiscuity because we didn't get a chance. I, sure, I, sure. You, Cause you had said that. Yeah, we didn't probably get a government both genders negatively and you said it's bad for both um i guess i'll go there and guys like the guy it just it seems like the come on yeah so the primary reproductive strategy is if you're a woman you need to find a man uh that is going to invest in your offspring because women can't do things with children alone they're um babies are no offense they're worthless okay we're like the first year of their life you're gonna marry them fucking everywhere um birth for women is incredibly yeah um compared to like cats a cat will fucking lay down and give birth like 20 fucking things and then like go running away like two seconds later you can like like horse can run away in half an hour the large cranial size is the adaptation is the reason why babies they're born useless um yeah which is interesting again not to pivot back but the thing we probably select for evolutionary is g 
right, is intelligence because that's what that's like our huge investment. It's why our babies fucking suck. It's but, why our hands are so but, fucking but big. It, it's why our brains are so many calories. Also, the, the, the reason why is because mm-hmm. we had to protect ourselves from other apex predators mm-hmm. and protect ourselves from other sure. tribes. And we so, do yes. it through socialization yes. and through intelligence, and not, not just having huge yeah. muscles and being tall. Totally those can help, like leading people. Um, but the um, they got no claws. Sure, um, true. <laughs> Fuck claws. We can manipulate things. We don't have claws. We're slow as shit. Yeah, we're not slow. We're very fast. We can long distance hunt any creature on this planet. I agree that we can long distance hunt, but there's very few mammals that we can outrun other than like a Yorkshire Terrier. We can outrun everything given a long enough time. Because we yeah, can correct. No, I yeah. totally agree with that. Even distance, horses, we can outrun. Even give distance, distance, a greyhound. Yeah. Yeah. Greyhound can't run for too long. They get tired. Yes, they are um, because we have an adaptation of, for sweat sweat glands, uh-huh. kneecaps, abductor and abductor or adductor muscles. And there's this thing in our. There's a great book. It's called The Story of the Human Body. By All right, we're, we're, we're really bitching. Sorry, go ahead. We're so. really bitching. Yeah, no, that's fine. Well, I would give credit where uh, human credit is too. Uh, we are the best long distance runners on the planet, hands down. Um, dogs can only sweat out their nose. So fuck them. Okay. Um, but the um, the thing that I was bringing up is that like, so a woman wants to find a man that is going to invest in her offspring as a parent. That is like your goal is to find a man and lock yeah. him down. And a man, because women, human adult females, don't give outward cues for when they are in heat, like cats do, mm-hmm. right? All yeah. you can do is fuck a woman over and over and over and over and over again until she gets pregnant, yes. right? Once she's pregnant, you can't really leave her because no other guy's going to come in because she's kind of now she's showing because now she's pregnant. Yeah. And the only way to ensure the reproductive success of your offspring is to stay there and raise the kids. So I think that even though we can use a lot of kind of like weird theories to get around this kind of high programmist stuff or the alpha beta box or whatever, I think and if you really simply look at it, no mental gymnastics, what a woman wants is a high investment parent. And what a man wants is a woman that he can f- for a long time to guarantee that the child is his. And I think that reproductively, mm-hmm. evolutionarily, psychologically, and genetically, that is the effective strategy of both but, parties. But couldn't he uh, pair bond with her while she's pregnant and still sleep with another woman? Um, could, he could, but the problem is he's Nick, probably not going to have the resources to do both. He, he could, but, but, maybe like two, but yeah. like, again, Nick Cannon, that's a very mm-hmm. modern thing. Yeah. In the past, you're not going to be able to hide all the coconuts under your tree. Remember, yeah. as strong as you are as a man in the past, two guys could probably kill you, yeah, right? Uh, sure. It's the same with gorillas. It's the same with um with, with any creature that have like alpha or betas today. No matter how strong you are, two or three people could probably kill you. You're never going to be fighting off like 100 people. Yeah, but I, so, you, yeah. you still, you also often see, though, men who have pregnant wives who go off and stray. That, they could, yeah. Happen. Yeah, mm-hmm. what I'm saying. I think, I think but I'm saying for reproductive success, you want to take care of that one, because you no guarantee now we can stray and do it because well who the care the government's going to take care of your kid yeah. but in the past if you stray f- your wife is probably f- she's dead yeah and the guy's not going to come by and take care of it because now she's f- pregnant right he's not, not going to ensure his reproductive success yeah. but men still want to do it for some reason and men throughout history like we said mm-hmm. before 40 percent of men replicating 80 percent of women mm-hmm. they have strayed i don't just know too many girls are like oh my husband cheated on me while i was pregnant because she was like less attractive for whatever reason yeah i agree i'm just, I'm just saying like i'm not going to disagree there has to be a yeah. push pull yes. where men are like chasing aggressively and women are like gatekeeping that has to exist I, some think, I think i think we're arguing degrees so the mate uh what was it the uh, uh mate the invest parental investment hypothesis which is for mm-hmm. every species of vertebrate which is the idea right. that that because it even works with fish and seahorses the mm-hmm. species that that has the larger sex cell or the species i'm sorry the gender that has more parental investment is the one that is the selective of the two genders and so with certain uh, types of fish and seahorses the men are the more selective and with mammals it is the female who almost exclusively are more selective mm-hmm. now there's different levels of selectivity like for say with bonobos there's very little and with homo sapien there is a lot in mm-hmm. fact homo sapien males are more selective than other males of other mammals we don't generally don't have sex with really attra- unattractive women we generally don't and cats will horses will mm. fucking do, you don't understand what i'm saying we're actually males are actually more selective than other species of mammals the females are extremely selective compared to us and i agree with you the difference what we're saying is though like i guess what were our differences you believe that the, it manif- you believe that women have this attraction to these other high status males they're just not f-ing them and you're saying evolutionarily that there's no evidence for them f-ing them and the reason why like while i may agree the problem is back then there was such a horrible horrible cost in having sex with the wrong guy and now there isn't now the, the mm-hmm. like you're just sitting there you're with your dude you're with your husband and you just happen to go to a chris brown concert and give him a blow job in the f- back in in the f- backstage and there's really no consequence for it and that's that, and that that's well we could talk about that but in some ways isn't that kind of better for shittier guys? What do you mean? Well, in the past, there's a high consequence for sex. Yes. So if you're kind of shit, a woman's not going to fuck with you. But now I can f- you yeah. and I can nut in you and you're not even get pregnant. Doesn't yeah. that kind of work for like the shitty guy too? Because now I can actually have full sexual access to you. You can fuck with me and you're not going to get pregnant off it. 
I, I, I'm kind of lost here. Wait, who is this? This is no offense to myself, but like 5,000 years ago, I don't know if I would have been fucking as many girls as I fuck today, but today right. I can do it because they don't have to have kids with me. <laughs> that, well, but yeah, so I'm saying in some ways, like birth control benefits men that want to fuck around a lot because now it might have been the case that like 5,000 years ago, a woman's like, I'm not opening my legs for you unless you're like the shit. Okay. Right. Whereas now, when we're like, I'll fuck you even if you so are shit, because I know I'm not so, going to so get pregnant. You're by you. birth control is making women more promiscuous? Yeah. I, well, I'm saying I, that I don't think what I'm saying is that you angle the theory in such a way that you say, well, women have birth control, so uh -huh. now they can cheat on their husbands at concerts. Like, okay, sure, women have birth control, but they also that should theoretically open up lower status men's access to them as well, because I, now I, they can f man with less um, responsibility. I, I think they basically. can, but mm -hmm. they're often fucking men with higher status as well, the ones they can get their hands on. Sure. I, if you want to say, look, we said before, twenty percent of men are deemed attractive on so on dating apps, eighty percent of men are deemed unattractive. Does that mean those twenty? percent of, of men are having sex with all those women no, no it just means that they're more attracted sure. to them. Yeah. we're going to rely on evolutionary theory to explain women chasing uh the top man mm -hmm. but then we're going to say well it breaks now where women are all willing to share a man because they've got birth control and it's like well if we're going to break it there we should also break it and say that women are willing to fuck lesser men because they're not going to have children it's as not well. just because of that i think i think enforced monogamy is uh, not enforced i'm sorry encouraged monogamy <sighs> is what helps lower quartile men have at least one sexual partner because throughout history we've had uh, with surplus men the idea of but this is the issue though when you say lower quartile men i think it's quintiles issue we're breaking into but um when you look at the data doesn't seem like it's lower quintile men that have a lack of access to sex because poor men are fucking more than wealthy men yeah, but we still see 33 percent of men having no sex. yeah but you don't know what court you know what my guess is my guess is that those numbers are probably overrepresented in the middle class that's my guess if yeah. you go to like a ghetto like i don't not to like yeah. rag on poor people i doubt that those people are like oh i can't f it's probably going to be the guys that are going to college maybe still live with mom and dad spend way too much time on the f internet you guys said it earlier the yeah. guys that are on f instagram the guys that are not playing league of legends that are jerking off the porn these aren't like the poorest members. Like, these are probably little middle class kids that are like i'm a f incel like when you see an incel guy you're not thinking of like a kid with a and you know a glock and a do-rag or whatever yeah. you're thinking of like a guy that probably plays too much world but of that, warcraft but that you know? guy with the glock and the do-rag is actually logistically around a lot more women sure. and has access to more but sex. i was just saying i was saying that because you brought up the lower quintile of men aren't f***ing, but then you appealed to that study earlier but that study didn't say the lower quintile of men it just said 19 to 30 year olds which right. i'm guessing are a lot of middle class kids in college well, so again it's not a socioeconomic problem and it's not even an evolutionary problem it's probably um, like a like a thing of like where are they at? Are they in their their house is doing nothing? It's a socioeconomic problem. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'll explain. Well, but if why. we say it's a socioeconomic problem, it's not because they're poor; it's because they have too much but money. I, 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 would, I, would, I would say, I would say this is poor, though. The nineteen-year-olds don't have as much resource. They have a yeah, nineteen-year-olds that aren't fucking are from wealthier families than the nineteen-year-olds that are. Yeah, but the problem when we talk about like uh, like women uh, congregating or becoming, uh, let's just say, uh, sharing the the alpha, women would rather share an alpha than be saddled with a faithful beta. They don't have to now be saddled with that faithful beta anymore because what they were using that guy for was long term security, parental investment, uh, you know, provisioning and protection. So now if they can go and get their uh, get their bag, get the money that they have, like go make it on OnlyFans or whatever else, they don't need that beta male guy anymore they don't need that you'll hear women on this show say i don't need a man i want a man the man that they want is a guy who looks like Je justin waller or looks like jason momoa whoever else okay because that's the guy that they want to have have on have sex with because they don't have to worry about getting pregnant with that guy anymore and they don't need the beta male uh -huh. to actually have to have as as any kind of investment for their future because they've already secured their secure or the, the belief is the perception once again yeah. is that even if they don't have it they know that they're going to get it or they they've so they've been uh, sold on this idea uh -huh. since the 19 since the mid 60s since the uh, post sexual revolution that they don't that they can become the men that they wanted to uh, that they wanted to marry uh -huh. and so therefore again does that not also track on to the whole thing about uh, was it four and a half percent of, of men right now are the ones that uh, women will on at least on dating apps anyways will will <laughs> go and and initiate uh, any some sort of interaction with sure and again that's a really fun concept it works well for YouTube videos and it's like it seems to make sense but. I can't find that anywhere in the real world. There's like no data to back that up at all. I mean, the data would be the data's already there. The data would be the top 10% of men on dating apps are getting 63% of the right. We can't and only appeal to dating apps because those markets are so skewed. It's uh, five men to every well, one well, woman. Of well, course, well, dating apps are going to be highly selective. Of course, but, but my point is, it's enough of the population to say that, that it does have some effect. That women, but, then, but then if that was the case, then I should be able to find that effect outside of dating apps. But the reality is, is that uh, people still f outside of dating apps. Not everybody yeah, only hooks up on a dating app, right? Like, I know this is anecdotal. Walk around with Justin Waller sometime in a f 
nightclub and you'll see what I'm talking like this idea that women. Yeah, and I'll tell you to yeah. go stroll through a McDonald's yeah. and you're going to see people f- that you would have never in a million years uh, imagined. Or f- that's true of every single shitty restaurant you've ever been in your entire life. And some of these guys are f- the waitresses. They're like, damn, how the f- do you even do that? I was like, I don't know. We work together every f- night. Men and women don't spend that much time around each other. Right? You're trying to cover the whole thing with logistics. And I, I'm just trying to say that like, if we have part of it, but not all of it. The point of a theory is, is when we have a theory, we design a theory. And hopefully what we do is if we design a theory and it's clean enough and it's good enough. It should be explanatory. So when we make a theory, we should be able to say, okay, I think that if, uh, if, uh, if this and this is true, then it works in my equation. I should be able to go to society and say, okay, this and that is true. Does the result end up as I want it to be? And for all of this idea of like women sharing high value men and women like changing their dating strategies only like go around like this guy, that data doesn't exist. There's nothing to back it up. Again, it's an interesting theory and it's a nice story, but there's no evidence for it. With Destiny, of course, the contrarian with the divorce. So you argue that divorce actually helps men more. Statistically, yes. Okay. All right. I'll turn it to you guys. Um, do you guys agree with that sentiment? Uh, do you rebut that? So I've with- heard you guys argue about this before. Mm-hmm. And, and so the, the fact that in the, the, the review or the number one refutation, not one, number one, but one of them would be the nine time, the nine times, de- s- sorry, self deletion rate yes. that would happen for men. And that happens in a lot of cases because the man is zeroed out financially after the divorce. And part of that zeroing out can come because of the is divorce. It, is it nine times? Can I say the word? Do I really have to say deletion? You say EPAR. You, 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 Great. You say suicide is fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you say like less than 10 times, we'll be all right. Okay. Gotcha. Um, <laughs> when, when we say that men are nine times more likely to come inside, what is that in comparison to? Uh, the general population, I believe. I believe it's wins against replacement. It's like. Well, it, because I'm curious because like, aren't men already like, is it five times more likely to come inside? Never, it's anywhere between four. Because if you're looking at like, like young men, it's uh-huh. like four times. Yeah, it's, so that's, that's, case, it's, it's really only two right. times more likely then. Right. right. But, but these are two different groups, right? Two different groups. This is the group of men in general and then the group of men who are divorced. Yeah. And so that's, that's different from what you're talking about, those men who are likely to commit suicide. I was in the military. Mm-hmm. Uh, some guy commits suicide every 22 minutes, something like that. It was mm-hmm. over attempt suicide. Um, the difference is that is a younger unmarried man, a man who is, has been married and is divorced is over the age of 40 and has lost all of his money is far more likely to commit suicide. So let's, sure. just, let's extrapolate. Is it because that. of loss of money or is it because of loneliness? Because well, I think suicide it, is massively overrepresented in older cohorts. So, so, the thing, so the thing is, it's the ability to start over and mm-hmm. then to garner those resources, those sexual, that sexual abundance, that financial abundance again, that is, that would be the reason. And let's extrapolate. If it's nine times more likely for them to commit uh, self deletion. Then what? What about the ones that don't even attempt it, but are still in like? Well, so the dis- question is, how how are you losing everything in a divorce? What does that mean? What does that look like? Not losing Death. everything, but like they lose everything. <laughs> it is one of the reasons why they would be more likely. Yeah, to but I'm trying suicide. to think of how do you lose everything in a divorce? Okay. Like, worst case, you're losing. I'm sorry. Let, let's let's go backwards. Okay. They lose everything, which then caught, which is a leading cause for their wives to them leave oh, okay, them. Sure. And so now what's happened is we've compounded the fact that the subprime mortgage crisis or the Corona crash or the crash of uh, the the invasion of Ukraine, mm-hmm. those three crashes that have happened in the last you know 20 years, though, or then there's also a flash. Yeah, I, yeah, I understand that. Yeah. And if, if that's how you're presenting, I can agree with it. But like my guess is going to be that like um, the suicide rate probably dramatically increases when children stop talking to their parents. But is it because they're making them kill themselves or is it because parents have alienated themselves from their kids? But not right? eight times the amount. Oh, it's not actually, there's research on that. What is, well, just curious, what is the year for this study? How many, what is the population group that is studying? The nice, how, you, you would know. I don't know. Because I hear this one brought up a lot, but I should have looked this up. No, I mean, there's, uh, you, you can Google it right now. There are dozens of. of uh, Jamie, can we. <laughs> okay, that's Chris. Yeah, no. Right, so Chris, I'm particular. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but I'm cu- I'm curious. I'd like to see what population so that's in again. So there's the uh, first of all, it's uh, the, the average uh, so it's suicide gen- rate. It's right? General of Men's Health. Hold on, mm-hmm. Tori so sent me this. By the way, okay. Uh, hold on, just keep talking. No, I was going to say the the average just in general is anywhere between three and three and a half and five times, depending on whose numbers you're using. General, general, for suicide, general, 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 general. general. Yes. Divorced men are more susceptible to heart disease, high blood pressure, and strokes than married men are. In addition to being thirty nine percent more likely to commit the thing and then engage in risky behavior. Well, mm. that is true. That's measuring the benefits of marriage, not necessarily the downsides of divorce because men that get married compared to men that don't get married are less likely to commit crime and are generally, uh, they have a longer lifespan and they fare better in terms of uh, multiple health metrics. Right. So, so the thing is then let's stay married. But then the end of the marriage is generally caused by women. Mm. And then afterwards- Yeah, but just because the woman is choosing divorce doesn't mean she caused the divorce. That's not necessarily true. Okay. Like if my, like, let's say my girlfriend cheats on me and then I'm like, oh, well, I'm breaking up with you. 
like, did I cause the breakup? Right. Um, so if women are choosing to get divorced, it doesn't mean that they're the ones that caused the relationship to fail. We don't have to figure out, like, right. well, what are the yeah, reasons why I, they choose? I don't know. Trip. That's really important, though, right. because we constantly, but, women are the ones yeah, that yeah, women I can't, can't throw out one more stat, though, is that the number one precipitator of divorce is when that woman makes more money than the guy does. They start even, or they start, start. he's making more, she gets a bump in. The money's in, the number one reason. Yeah. I don't okay. believe that's true. I've never seen that in any survey ever. I'd be interested in that. It could be true, but I've never seen that ever anyway. Um, so here are, the, here are the metrics that I'm generally measuring, because I feel like suicide is like kind of a that's like a one we can do, but that's a very, very niche population. So I think that men fare better than women in divorce because they tend to make more money. So I'm quoting from an article from The Atlantic in 2016. Despite the common perception that women make out better than men in divorce proceedings, women who worked before, during, or after their marriages see a 20% decline in income when their marriages end. According to Stephen Jenkins, professor at the London School of Economics, his research found that men, meanwhile, tend to see their income rise more than 30% post-divorce. Meanwhile, the poverty rate for separated women is 27%, which is triple the figure for separated men. That's one thing. The second thing is they're more likely to remarry. Quoting from Pure Research, 64% of divorced or widowed men have remarried compared to only 52% of previously married women. Um, another the th uh, point three is they don't have the responsibilities of caregiving. Um, I'm quoting from finding caregiving stats is actually really difficult, but it seems to be settled upon that 90% of parents will settle custody disputes without a judge. Um, on average, women that get child support only get $286 a month. 80% um, of custodial parents in the US are mothers. Um, only 4% of these child custody cases actually go to trial. And in 2017, full child support payments were only received by 46.4% of custodial mothers. So it seems like they, so they've got a lot of extra responsibilities related to caregiving. Their income is down. Um, they don't even get full child support all the time. And the child support they make is like pretty low. Um, uh, uh, for point number four is if men choose to fight for custody, they oftentimes win it. Um, the largest study I could find on this, this is an older one, but it was the only big scale one I could find, but it was from an old Massachusetts gender bias study, which was published in the New England Law Review. This was in 1990. And they said, we began our investigation of child custody aware of a common perception that there is a bias in favor of women in these decisions. Our research contradicted this perception. Although mothers more frequently get primary physical custody of children following divorce, this practice does not reflect bias, but rather the agreement of the parties and the fact that in most families, mothers have been the primary caretakers of the children. Fathers who actively seek custody obtain either primary or joint physical custody over 70% of the time. My next point is that alimony is rare. Quoting from a legal blog, in the 60s, 25% of divorce settlements included alimony. Now it's like 10%. Um, and it's starting to reverse more for men getting some alimony as women start to earn more. And then the divorce rate has been falling since the 90s. So I don't know why we even talk about this so much. But that's my broad point about divorce. I feel like it's hyped up a ton. But I don't think that men make well, out uh, horribly in divorce. rate in falling in the 90s yeah, so is because the marriage rate is at an all-time low right now. It, it tracks with the well, marriage rate. Well, that's fine. Rates, but then at least so. you're not having as many people... Well. Oh. Sure, but uh, yeah, I mean, at least you're not having as many people getting destroyed by so, that. Is, is your argument that women fare better? Because I just so they, I know what they're going to debate here. Mm -hmm. Is your argument that men fare better after divorce, or they just fare uh, not as bad? After My argument is that post divorce, uh -huh. um, in the actual court proceedings, a woman might win a little bit more. But the yeah. reason why is because post divorce, men are in a much better position than women who are in a much worse position. That even if you get like a little bit of alimony and child support, yeah. the fact that you're now a primary full time caregiver for a child, you have no parental support, that your income is lower, your ability to remarry goes lower, and your poverty rate is much higher. So you're you think what, women are actually worse off after divorce than men? That's yes, your argument. Yes, yes. Women are worse yes, off. Yes. In okay. almost every measurable metric. I can't find it, except I guess and maybe I, the suicide I, thing. I, I, lack, I looked it up just mm -hmm. to be objective here. Um, number one cause of divorce. This is lack of commitment, but that's an sure. extremely broad. Yeah, of that course. Can be Which just sucks because in relationships, a lot of it is, right? Like, for instance, somebody could get divorced because somebody's going to take up the trash, yeah. right? But did they really? Or lack of sex. But lack of sex is never about lack of sex. It's usually because other shit is going on sure, too, right? Because yeah. lack of commitment yeah. can be finances too. It could, so, yeah, it could yeah. be. Yeah, it's very broad. Or it could so, be would, partner gains weight, or it could be. Yeah. Could be any of that. So, you, did you guys have anything? To, so you're saying women fare better for in every measurable metric, divorce. except for the suicide stat that I've never looked up before. I guys, I should have. But yeah, you guys, I, I can think. From, I'll text it to you. Yeah, we just sure. got it right now. But it's yeah. The, I found we found the it's nine, nine to one, one actually. It's yeah. nine times the ratio now. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it's, but that also doesn't surprise me, though. But I don't think I don't think quite, oh, yeah, sorry, any arguments towards him that uh, women fair because he's. I would like to see more recent stats yeah. first of all, and then 
this is to be fair like this is not the hill i want to die on i agree sure. i think divorce sucks for both people and i do think i agree suicide, with that yeah the suicide rate for men is definitely higher as far as men out earning women men out earn women in general and so before there's a marriage and then afterwards it, it, as well so yeah i agree with that but i wish people would bring that up more because people was like men always have to pay more after marriage. well yeah because men are generally earning more right, right? yeah I, but i think where where we differ a little bit is that i do think that because of the things that you just stated mm -hmm. that women are not all I, we, you had the discussion before i don't i agree with you women do not get married thinking fuck yes i'm going to take all this guy's money i do know some women who are like that but it's very few and they're usually super attractive women mm -hmm. they're gold diggers and just got found the richest guy they could get sure borderline personality sort of all right and then but <laughs> point of my way but <laughs> but going but going a little further they get into the marriage and then there is a point where there's a an inflection point where it's like i could stay i could leave and that money becomes an incentive for them to leave. I do think that does happen. I don't think that it's on their wedding money, day. But you always it's have on their wedding day. But as a married couple, you have access to all the money. Why would you leave and then get less? Uh, why would you leave and get less? Like, do, do like if I'm married to, to a woman, we are we share our finances. It's a legal arrangement. Like we have yeah. to. If I leave, well, now I've got to fucking I, I do fight. Think, I do think men can withhold. Find, we saw that soccer player who did put all his money in his mom's name and, and she he no shot if he did do that there was a very big legal loophole but like this is such a deal that some so here's something uh it doesn't work in the united states you're right this yeah to, not, not to give too much yeah, advice to the women women isn't like if you're a woman and you're trying to file for divorce yeah. and you don't have money to do it the divorce will say actually contact your husband's lawyer because that he has to give you the money for it because if you're still married your finances are still joint finances whether you like it or not i mean that right? by the way that thing you just said is how mm -hmm. you go broke you both go broke. Divorce attorneys. Sure. But again, like divorce attorneys, like the fighting, like even for the custody stuff, like 90% of custody disputes are settled without a judge even ever getting involved. Right. Right. So it's really rare. Yeah. I guess the thing that I'm trying to point out is that like only 4% of child custody cases ever even go to trial. Sure, it's ugly. And that's of the child custody cases. So that's 4% of the 10%. They're very, 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 very rare. But it feels like the manosphere in general, like bases all of their discussion around like mom going to court, getting alimony could, and fighting for child could support. It be, mm -hmm. Could it be though? That only four of them percent go to trial because of how, one how expensive it is, and number two because they already know as a man the likelihood of them getting custody is lower. But if they fight for it, and again, I I am being fully honest here, it's yeah. really hard to find data on this. Yeah. The only big nice study I could find was in the spring of 1990 in the New England Law Review. Uh, Law Review. I'm sorry, um, where they studied in Massachusetts. It seems like men who fight for custody right. get it over 70% of the time. Okay. Now I've seen a stat floating around because there are a ton of Why legal blogs. Why do you think it's hard to find? Um, it's hard to find because I, I don't know. There's not much research on it right now, but. Okay, so, so here's the thing. But I'm guessing a lot of this is probably like public roster stuff that, because divorce cases are public. Hey, again, if you guys want to fund research on this, I'll throw money at it. It'd be interesting. Nobody so funding, funding this research. Let's use an analogy. If I'm, <laughs> if I'm, if I'm uh, uh, arraigned on murder charges, mm -hmm. the likelihood of me taking this to trial is higher if I think I'm going to win mm -hmm. and if I have the resources to fight it. The likelihood of me not taking it to trial and settling is the more likely that I believe that I'm not going to win the, the trial and because I want leniency from the judge. So I might say the same analogy for these men, 4% of the time it goes to trial because they're told by both, both divorce attorneys, the man's and the woman's, bro, you're not going to win this shit. And he tells the woman, yeah. you are going to win this shit. So the likelihood of them going to trial may be biased yeah. by that. There's by that a, there's a well, really I, can... I don't know if you, I, I always suggest this. Whenever if anyone brings up the, uh, divorce, I would say, go watch Divorce Corp. That's a documentary that was done, like, I think it was 2014. It was like uh, Dr. Drew Prinsky was the guy who funded the whole thing. And it's, it's about the divorce machine. So it's like from the before you get married to when you get married to when you get, when you're on your way and you're getting divorced. Also, it covers, uh, uh, was it a prenuptial agreements, which is one of the reasons like if you watch that, you will understand just how useless a prenuptial agreement is for the average, for the average person. Why are they useless? Because, because they're, of what they're, you said before, they have the, to be the, updated all the time. That's true. And they also don't have anything to do with child support either. True. But that's so. not useless. If you've got a lot of assets that you want to protect, a prenuptial agreement can yeah, be really important. I, mean, I know that people say like, well, they get well, time. for the average person. Yeah. Okay. Just for that. Well, but even for the average person, I don't know if, it, like, in general, because you're probably not going to have that many you assets. Have to watch but it. the it's real reason is really great. It's actually pretty entertaining. Well, sure. But, like, again, I don't, it's an ideologically driven, probably, I'm guessing, the documentary that's trying to push like I don't know. Okay, sure. But again, I'm just looking at stats. You guys have much disagreement with them on women don't fair is bad and fair well i mean i would say i would say that okay it's uh first of all the alimony you got to remember that alimony in the laws in the united in the united states because there's there's we, we have to also take into account where 
if you go and you look at Europe and you look at the divorce rates over there, it's a whole different animal than it is here in the United States. So uh, if you look at alimony uh, laws in the U.S., a lot of them, uh, depending on what it is, is uh, they're founded on uh, Depression era conditions because back in the dust bowl in the 19th you know the early 30s and stuff when a guy was leaving his wife because he could no longer afford the family or whatever that's why those particular laws were instated in the first place and we're still hanging on to them as legacy laws right now uh -huh. depending on the state depending on whatever's what's going on um so you all you often you'll hear people will say well um the woman's making more money and so therefore the guy is now getting alimony in like this fraction of one percent but those are the those are the you know the sort of the what man bites dog you know sure well real quick though, according to the 2000 census in the U.S., 0.5 percent of alimony recipients recipients in the U.S. were male. By 2010, that was 13 years ago, 3 percent of them were male. So it's mm -hmm. probably a little bit higher now. As well, women more. make more and more money. Yeah, exactly. again, again, coming into the coming into the thing. Uh -huh. um, Do you think that alimony is a concept is fair? I think it I used. Know. I think it used to be. I think it needs definitely needs reform from the 1930s. As from long the as, era, as, long as we did. maintain this thing where it stops when she gets remarried. That's sure. why would she ever get remarried? The problem, I feel like that's a really weird incentive. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 I'm not an incentive. I'm just saying. Like, well, no, no, because I'm saying like, because she literally sounds like a boyfriend and it's like, well, I'm not married and she never actually marries the guy because the alimony would stop. That seems like a bit. I understand what you're yeah. saying though, but I think we, do we probably cool. agree that like the concept of like, I marry a woman and I'm like, listen, I want you to stay home for 15 years and take care of my kid. Yeah. And she's like, okay, fine. And then at the end, I'm like, actually, my secretary is way hotter and cooler than you. I'm dumping you. Bye. She should probably get yeah. something. Yeah, and she's yeah. like, fuck me. I've like spent 15 yeah. years of my life and I get a fuck. So right? I, th I think mm -hmm. it goes back to that whole ice and fire thing I was saying before. There's sure. a bunch of guys that are worried about being taken advantage of mm -hmm. because men have been taken advantage of in divorce proceedings. Sure. So with women, though, and in, in, okay. in child rearing for sure. proceedings. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. But who has more incentive in that sense? The who, man. Who, who I would thinks much, that they have more Every man would say the same. Would you rather lose half your shit in divorce or would you rather have a child that you are now the primary care caretaker for the next 18 years it's, well, it's way more than 18 trust me on that. Sure, no i know but at, le at the very least <laughs> yeah. before you kick him out right yeah, yeah. that's a way bigger burden and people always say like oh my god i've got to pay child support child support on average was like less than 300 dollars a week primary caregiver kids are a lot of work that's a huge sacrifice in career huge sacrifice in future earnings huge sacrifice in relationship status like it's a it's going to drag every single part of your life right that's why single mothers i think the poverty rate was three times higher for single mothers and single fathers um goes back, go, goes back to, your, to, your, to your list mm -hmm. the whole thing Exactly. Yeah. Well, the other part is you got to remember that what forty two percent of children in the United States are born out of wedlock to begin with. Yeah. So if we're going to look at like child, but uh -huh. I, and I love this too because we, we, I, I constantly get this one is like where they're saying you know we don't have involved fathers or anything. It's like they're, they're basing the uh, the involvement of fathers based on whether or not they're married to the baby mamas right now. So um, that, that, that I mean that's neither here nor there. But I would also all, you have to also throw in the factor of the divorce machine in the in the first place. If you watch that uh, divorce core um, uh, documentary, you can because they, they interview divorce attorney. You guys have divorce attorneys on here as well. They they it's in their best interest to perpetuate it to keep it to keep the machine going. It's like basically churn marketing because sure. the longer they stay there, the more they have billable hours. In the United Kingdom, they give loans to women, eighteen percent interest loans, in order mm -hmm. to encourage them to fight for the divorce. And they say mm -hmm. on average, you earn three times your money back if mm -hmm. you take a loan. So yeah, people are okay. definitely predatory. So now the other thing that we did that you and I did together, um, not to I think it was last year. Um, yeah, we were taught we did the divorce show. Yeah, and in the divorce show, we also uh, we we covered the fact that. Uh, the average age of first marriage in the United States is for men right now, I believe it's like 30 and for women, it's about 28 or 29, somewhere in there. And as a result, if you look at the average duration of an American marriage, it's anywhere between seven and uh, well, no, five and nine years. So seven is basically yeah. the average. So yeah. when you look at the duration of that, of that, uh, that divorce or the, what's going to lead to divorce right there, it coincides with the fact that a woman can get to the point where she's kind of like checking out of the sexual marketplace. Yeah. She has the kid and then she's incentivized or she believe the perception once again is she's perceives that is she is incentivized that if I leave this guy, I can do eat, pray, love. It's what we call divorce porn, right? The grass is greener on the other side. Yeah. And how, so we, what, what we did during that show is we said, okay, is this true? Can we look, can we track this? And sure as shit, we can track it. In fact, we can track it with that, the same, let's say variation on the theme all the way from the sixties, all the way up to where we are right now. I'm, when you so say the track incentive, it, uh, no, again, mm -hmm. it's not that every woman will, it's that any woman can. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious for the training. So, cause, so this was in 2014, mm -hmm. um, peer research said that 64% of divorced or widowed men 
get remarried, whereas only 52% of previously married women. And then when they surveyed people on whether they wanted to get remarried, 30% of men in divorce after divorce said they never want to get remarried. 54% of women said they never wanted to get remarried. So I'm curious, when you say you track that divorced women do better afterwards, where did you track that? But they're saying they don't want to get married and then fewer of them are getting married. So that would not indicate that they're worse off. That means they're choosing to not get married. No, no, no. But but his choice was that women are choosing a divorce because they know they can do better and get married. uh, The the reason why we did that show in the first place is relates to something that you said is like if what is it, 75% of divorces are initiated by women now of course the most popular uh response to that is well if men were better and they it's it's men's fault that women would have to do it in the first place well there's also the incentivization or at least there is a there are numbers that show that there could be but i'm curious what the incentive is if women fare worse in divorce than men in every single metric except for i like, guess suicide so unless you're planning on not killing yourself it well, doesn't seem like well, what's the what's the popular conception is that they're going to get 86% of the time they're going to get custody the popular, unless the guy fights I, I think the popular not fight for it because he's got a divorce attorney saying don't fight for it because it's going to cost you x amount you can't do it because I, uh, I, I think I think the popular conception is divorce humiliating I don't think anybody wants to go through Correct but, but, but I'm curious if you were if you were to look at this based on a woman and obviously there's no way to really do this but like f- age and physical attractiveness huh. like a woman who's 32 still really hot because of plastic surgery might actually be more incentivized to get a divorce get the money and then because she can remarry um i don't know i mean that, yeah that i understand be- i understand what we're saying here and I, again i understand the theory on the micro level but on the macro i don't i just don't know if it would play out this way like if a woman is um i'm gonna <laughs> Like, if I wanted to appeal to other stereotypes, women aren't the best, like, financially. Like, what do you think this woman is thinking? When she's, like, 32, is she like, all right, I'm going to get divorced from this. I'm going to buy 500 shares of Amazon, 2,000, like, S&P 500, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to invest my money. I'm gonna find, like, bro, you are a misogynist, bro. You are a misogynist, bro. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> I hate women. <laughs> women. Okay. Listen, dude, I'm only bi for long enough to like a fully gay, right? Because fuck women, right? No, but seriously, like, do, do we really say? Do we really? Think, no, 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 no. Do we really think that women at 32 are actually making like high power financial decisions? Like, like have you met a woman at 32 who's divorced? Like, is she, are they really making these types of statements? Like, can't they? Like, you, you're right. Yeah, sure, yeah. And again, I just I feel like the humiliating I start around like all of it is. We'll meet you halfway on one point though, which is I don't think that women like go into a marriage to say, you know what, I'm really gonna. I'm going to take this motherfucker to the cleaners here in another four or five years. I don't think that they like go into a marriage thinking that that's what they're going to do. It's like malice or forethought. No, Mm -hmm. I don't think so. But again, when it becomes an option or when the incentive is, well, if I divorce this guy, I'm still hot enough and I'm 38 and I'm not quite 40 yet. I might be able to go and like find another dude like that. We as culturally, at least in Western societies, we, we have eat, pray, love. We have Stella got our groove back. We got whatever the next, you know, divorce porn, uh, uh, narrative yeah. is. So, so the perception is there that it's available. It, it's what's uh, what's what uh, Dalrock used to call Dalrock used to call the threat point. Okay, mm-hmm. and so guys say, well, uh, what is it? Happy wife, happy life. That's that's not folk wisdom. <laughs> that is an ultimatum right now. You better keep this bitch happy because if you don't, she's going to take you to the cleaners. That's the or you're not. She's going to hold out on you or whatever else. Sure. And but, I guess that might be the case that mm-hmm. there's a perception, which I don't even know how we begin to measure that. But like statistically, no, I'm mean, saying that that. But again, I think that, I don't think that women go in like with like t- the women's not going to go in to have uh you know to get married just so she can go take this guy to this cl- the, to the cleaners unless the guy is like you know an old dude with a lot of money but mm-hmm. fair yeah. enough uh all right so uh any any chats here that i gotta read chris or okay so any anything you guys got uh before we uh close out here i know destiny's got to catch a flight in i just got off an airplane Damn. and i'm delirious I, I, was gonna, gonna, I was trying to keep up with the last point i have I to think I've been up for 36 oh, hours right yeah. now because okay. we really by the way thanks for coming because we really wanted to do this to the point where we were like rearranging flights so we could come out sure and yeah. Yeah. 